Hello again and welcome to another day of Daily Bible Study. We're continuing on with Paul's first letter to Timothy. Uh, we're starting in chapter 2 today. So before we do that, let's pray. Uh, loving God, um, we have been so good as human beings of making dividing lines between us that it is so easy to think that when, when, when you say to pray for all people, you mean all people like us. But you mean something much bigger than that. Lord, we ask that you would help us to see your vision for the people, that even those we would count to be our enemies or our opponents or in any other way not part of our group, Lord, help us to see them as you see them and let us not rest uh, until we have prayed as fervently as possible and done what we can to serve. Lord, we ask you to be with us d- during this time, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here I pick up on uh, uh, chapter 2, uh, we're going to do verses 1 through 7. Um, it says, first of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man, or God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling you the truth, I am not lying, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So, there are two moments in this passage where Paul is talking about things about, excuse me, about all men, by which he means all people. He doesn't mean all male people, he just means all people. And, and there's two things. One, he says, I urge you to be uh, having entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving. He says, do that, be praying for all people. And he says that the God is a God who wants all people to be saved. Now, what does that mean? I think at the very least, because of the context, it comes right on the heels of this talk about Hymenaeus and Alexander, who we talked about yesterday, were those who Paul said he has handed over to Satan so they can learn not to blaspheme, um, which seems to be a very extreme thing. But I think we're met both in the context before that, where Paul says that God saved him to give everybody else hope, essentially, and now saying we want you to pray for all people. I think that all has to include Hymenaeus and Alexander. This is the deal. Maybe maybe you're not allowing them to be part of the life of the church anymore. Maybe you are not uh, inviting them to continue to have an influence among the people. And yet, it does not mean you cut them off from your prayer. The prayer, you know, God wants you, God wants us to pray for all people, um, because God wants all people to be saved. I was at um, a meeting of the International House of Prayer at the end of the year. This is many years ago, and by evidence by the fact that one of the things that was announced at one point was. Uh, the imminent hanging of um, Saddam Hussein, you know, the imminent execution of this, I mean, terrible person. And at first, the whole group of people, I mean, you know, well over 10,000 people started, started cheering. And the people in the front said, whoa, whoa, you know, not, not trying to pretend like this guy hadn't done terrible things, but he says, this is a man who is on the verge of meeting Jesus, you know, and yes, he's done terrible things. And yes, he has done things from a human perspective that are unforgivable. And yet, we are called by God to pray for all people because God wants even people like this to turn to Jesus and be saved. And that's a hard sell in some ways. And yet, I thought, what a beautiful reminder that even if we can't decide for other people, we don't get to, we don't get to decide that we're not going to pray for somebody. We don't get to decide that God hates them as much as we do. You know, we have to remind ourselves that even our greatest enemies are ones that God wants to be saved, wants to turn to him. Now, some people will take this idea of that God wants all people to be saved. This is, well, if God wants all people to be saved, then obviously all people are going to be saved no matter what. I don't get the sense that that's what Paul's trying to say here. Uh, the sense seems to be much more in the line of this thing of, you know, we need to continue to pray for people because God does not consider any human being to be beyond hope, uh, even if we sometimes do. And so I, I lift that up because you know, there's a sense almost where um, you know, there's, we want to cut people off, you know, that somebody has hurt us too much, or somebody has hurt our country too much, or somebody has been, done just terrible, despicable deeds. And yet, you know, what is the greater miracle? What is the greater miracle, that God condemns the guilty, or that God can so work even in the hearts of the most guilty people in history um, as to turn them around? I think that if Paul were here with us, I think that if we were to say these great war criminals throughout history who have done truly despicable things, and I'm not trying in any way to soft pedal any of that, the truly despicable things, and we say to Paul, surely, surely we shouldn't be praying for them. Surely they have, they have abandoned, they have, they have, they have given up any, anything, any claim they might have uh, to the love and mercy of God. And I think Paul would say, would you think, say that about me too? 
because I used to seek out Christians because they were Christians just to have them murdered. You know, if, if, this, if these people are beyond the reach of God's grace, what about me? And he would then point to his life and say, look, I mean, they've done terrible things. No, no, no pretending that they didn't. And yet the victory of Jesus is such that, you know, even if not till the end of their lives, even when to the point where they can no longer do anything to try to make amends for what they have done, even still, if they can come and voluntarily kneel before Jesus, this is a victory of the love of God. And it doesn't undo the bad things they've done, just like it doesn't undo, you know, the, the, the executions that Paul oversaw. And it's just a reminder of that. And I, I think it's just a fa- I think about that particular experience a fair amount of the time, and I wonder uh, who is it that I am reluctant to pray for, and I am reminded to continue to seek the mercy of God even for those people who have personally harmed me. And so I encourage it for you too. It's not easy even a little bit. And yet, if we want to be disciples, if we want to be the kind of people that Paul's talking about, that Jesus calls us to be, at some point we have to realize that as God forgives his enemies, we have to find a way through the grace of God, through the Holy Spirit, to forgive ours. Well, that's all for today. Come back again tomorrow, and we will look at one of those great and somewhat controversial passages in this particular letter of 1 Corinthians. Have a good day.